This is our special called budget workshop led by Deputy City Manager Mark McDaniel, and I will turn things over to him. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to turn over to Christiane in just a moment, but I want to say some introductory remarks. So uh, we talked to you all about having some mini budget work sessions uh, early on in the process as opposed to waiting until the proposed budget comes out. And so this, that's what this is all about. This first one, though, is going to really talk more about how we put the budget together so that everybody's starting from the same uh, point and, and how we do this. So we're going to get a little bit into the weeds about our process. Um, and then we're also going to take you through a, uh, an example of a department that we're putting through the priority-based budgeting right now, environmental services. Future workshops in the one hour that we'll try to schedule, we'll do a deeper dive on individual other individual departments. Uh, but you're going to get see um, just kind of how the you know, sausage is made a little bit in terms of how we put the budget together. Uh, we have three of these already scheduled. We will schedule more, um, but we only have those three scheduled so far. So stay tuned on the additional uh, budget sessions. And also, if there's particular departments that you want to um, go you know, deeper in in terms of understanding, um, let us know what those departments are and we make sure that we schedule them because we've got 26 departments and I think it's going to be hard to fit all of those in, but we sure want to fit those in that, that you all want to see the most. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christiane. Christiane? Thank you, Mark. And as Christiane's getting started, just a reminder, this is something new we're doing this year out of response for management is doing out of response to our comments after last budget. So use these wisely. I know that um, we all get tired of meetings, but use the hour and then also provide them feedback, um, as Mark just asked for, because these will only be as good as we make them. Christiane. Thank you. Yes, you took the words right out of my mouth, both of you. Um, so we know, I want to acknowledge, I know it's been a long day, especially for some people who have been here since the EMS meeting this morning, but we hope this can be helpful. Um, speaking on behalf of the lab, we are really excited for your excitement in engaging more robustly and earlier in the process. And so these work sessions are a response to that. And like the mayor said, um, they can evolve and develop as needed in order to make them most helpful to you. Today's agenda is fairly light and consumable, and Mark hit it on the head. Um, you've recently seen fiscal health information as part of the council retreat, so we're not necessarily starting from there. Um, but because we're starting to share earlier with you, and we're still very early in the budget process, today's agenda is a hybrid of like practical foundational knowledge and then sort of the peek at something newer um, with regard to PBB, which is our you know newer initiative. So, with that, I'm going to quickly go over the budget calendar, which I think we're only taking it through June here, but I want to share some of the work that's been done so far. Um, so we'll talk a little bit in a few minutes about what prior year commitments are. Some of you are already familiar with that term, um, but the departments have been working on prior year commitments since January and, and some even before. Um, and that's a foundational part of the budget process that, again, we'll all define in just a few minutes. But Ongoing work's been happening since January, um, February, and then on the priority-based budgeting side, we did a kickoff earlier than our typical budget kickoff because there's a lot of, again, foundational work that has to be done with that new initiative. Um, and so then last month, we um, began to load budget information into Questica, which is our budgeting system, um, and continued the PBB work. And uh, also last month, which is just kind of a funny thing as far as being in the weeds about what budget's doing, we did a budget kickoff like usual, um, and we introduced this new thing that was fun called the budget fair. And so in the budget fair, um, we did a science fair theme because that's how cheesy we are in the lab, um, and we wore lab coats. And uh, so this, the fair, the event was um, sort of meant to respond to the varying levels of information that departments need when they're kicking off budget. So some people really need a deep dive into certain subjects. And some kind of have their fiscal staff and their stuff together. Um, and so people could spend as much time as they wanted sort of learning about revenue or allocations or prior year commitments. We also included the other parts of the lab. So we had comp plan there, like some of the planning initiatives. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share a few pictures because the staff really had fun with the, with the budget fair. And then David did his um, inspiring normal kickoff comments too. So now we're in April. Yeah, it, it was. <laughs> I'll take my $20. Um, so then in April now, uh, we are officially budget developing. So right now, a budget 
you know, departments are, are entering budgets into Questica. And so the analysts are working hard to review that work as it's happening. Um, and then on the PBB side, we're in the middle of peer review, which we'll talk about uh, later in the presentation. And so over the next couple of months, we only go through June on this calendar and we'll continue to roll forward with our, with our work sessions as we go. But um, budgets are due from the departments in May. I can't remember the exact date, but soon in May. Um, and then we'll begin to figure out how to overlay, we're starting, we're already figuring it out. We'll begin overlaying uh, priority-based budgeting scoring into sort of the existing budget system. Um, and then in June, we have a budget blitz, uh, which is sort of like a three-day marathon of hearing about uh, department budget requests and um, start to talk about decision packages. So not like in years past, we'll be visiting with you throughout this process instead of starting to visit with you in August. So you'll see earlier previews of a lot of this uh, through these work sessions. Christiane, before you uh, move from that slide, if I can ask a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know in the past, uh, this council has uh, expressed some concern about making sure that we get community input prior to any finalization of those budget considerations. Is that incorporated in? this chart that we're looking at? So I know it's not specifically called out, but we do we are doing earlier engagement this year. And maybe maybe at the end of today, we can talk a little bit about the fiscal year 25 budget engagement schedule. Would that be OK? I'm looking at Amethyst and Michelle. Yes, they say OK. Is that all right? Can we talk about engagement? Yeah, sort that's of? fine, if, as long as it's flushed out later. Thank yeah, you. great. OK. So development of target budgets. So the, the city has traditionally engaged in target-based budgeting, and we're still doing that. Um, so pr providing departments a framework uh, in which to build their budget is a structured and reasonable way to start the process, and it ensures that any additions to the budget um, are made through a transparent process. In this city, we use decision packages. So um, people meet their target budget, and then if they want to exceed that target, they have to explain why, right? So um, in order to build the target, we start from, this is, a, okay, I wanna shout out to one of my budget analysts for thinking of this cake analogy that you're gonna see, I really like it. Um, a target budget is predetermined from the prior year budget, so fiscal year 25 budget is built from the fiscal year 24 adopted budget. Um, and then there are several stages of adjustment that happened, and this just occurred in March, so um, these are the targets that, that departments are working from now. So stage one is the adopted budget, fiscal year 24 budget, and we'll, we'll look at it in a second. Um, but that's the starting point for every operating department. Next, one-time costs. Um, one-time costs are uh, expenses that were incurred in the year, but we can take them out. They don't require any more funding. So typically, this happens um, when people get decision packages that maybe have startup costs. Um, Startup capital, computers, cars, um, and then sometimes we, we're gonna, I'm looking at some more examples. Um, in fiscal year 24, you know, we had an extra fire trainee class, so like that's been backed out. So things like that that are one time um, and then can be reduced. And so from fiscal year 24 to 25, um, there were about, uh, is almost $10 million, $10 million in one time expenses that we backed out between the adopted budget stage and then this one time cost stage. Ooh. Okay, um, the third stage is prior year commitments, which I mentioned on the budget calendar. So these are budget items that impact a fiscal year budget because of things we've agreed to in the past. Um, the best example of these are police and fire contracts. So when there are scheduled salary increases, those are built in as prior year commitments. You also th you see things like um, CPI increases for the zoo or for the, you know, for botanic gardens or solid waste, like things that are CPI increases that we know are coming, those then get added back in. So adopted budget, less one-time costs, plus prior year commitments. And I think, I don't know if this was the first year, but it was certainly the first year in a while that we solicited prior year commitments from departments instead of just, we have our own list, but we also solicited from departments to ensure that we weren't missing anything and didn't get surprised later in the process. Because one of the things that's happened in the past is we've seen decision packages from departments saying like, hey, this was supposed to be a prior year commitment. You guys missed it. So we tried to be a little more collaborative up front. Um, I believe prior year commitments for FY25, um, were, they totaled $45 million in the general fund. The big drivers of those are um, police, meet and confer, 
of the CBA um, and pay for performance. Those are a couple of the, the top drivers there. Um, and then we go into cost allocations where we allocate costs um, out to the departments to identify you know, sort of the total cost of services. There are various internal departments who allocate their costs, like IT, property management, and we do an admin cost allocation. Um, and so in the general fund, we typically hold departments harmless for those kinds of allocations unless they can be directly responsible for them. Um, and so this year, allocations to the general fund, 7.2 million addition to the target. And then, Finally, the cake topper, um, salary and benefit projections. So this is when we, uh, we solicit HR for any upcoming potential increases like health insurance, sort of the drivers, pay for performance, um, retirement. So for instance, this year's budget has a 5% sort of placeholder in the target for health insurance um, and a 4% placeholder for pay for performance. So those are already added into department's target budgets. And that's what makes the cake. So. Adopted budget, less one-time cost, plus prior commitments, allocations that we're holding people harmless for, and salary and benefit placeholder projections. And this is how it looks currently. So fiscal year 24 adopted budget, this is general fund. This is the billion 13 number at the bottom. Fiscal year 25 target, as of right now, and again, we're sharing early, and sometimes the hazard of sharing early is, you know, there could be a, a couple of tweaks here and there, but um, the fiscal year 25 target budget is a billion 48, so almost a billion 49, so a three and a half percent increase across the board. And if you're wondering, which you might be, why neighborhood services is going down, I also wondered the same thing when I pulled this data, and um, it's a mistake, so. I'll fix it. <laughs> what happened, the, the priority repair program that we increased last year was loaded as a one-time uh, one time increase. And I don't think it was intended to be one-time. So we will fix that. So I don't want you to be alarmed. But I found that at the last minute. Um, everything else you can kind of see there. If you have any questions about drivers, we can talk about those. But this is where we sit as of right now in April, general fund, budget development, how we, when we walk through the cake, this is where we've landed. Okay, um, as part of building the target, we also build the preliminary PAYGO matrix. So as you know, PAYGO financing uses cash for capital, um, saves us from paying interest on debt, lowers debt. Um, we've talked about PAYGO extensively. I don't think you need a, an education there. This is a reminder that PAYGO is seven cents of the fiscal year 24 tax rate allocation. Um, in our models now, we're assuming 4% growth. And these are some of the things that are funded in PAYGO. You've seen these buckets before. Not every single thing is listed here, but these are some of the bigger, bigger buckets. Uh, and so in fiscal year 25, we actually have a good forecast here, but this is, counts for 4% growth. But in fiscal year 25, you'll see uh, that the PAYGO total is uh, almost 78 million and sort of how it's preliminarily breaking out among the big, um, the big buckets there, big departments. And we can deep dive any of the capital or PAYGO stuff in a future work session. I'm sure it's of interest, um, but just wanted to show you how it's, how it's loaded in the budget system as we stand today. Any questions? Okay. Okay, so priority-based budgeting. This is the newer preview, and um, Environmental Services, Cody has been generous in giving some of his time today to help turn, I think, turn a concept into something more practical, because even for me, until lately, it's been more conceptual than practical in my brain. Um, so priority-based budgeting is something that we want to use to augment our traditional, you know, target-based budgeting, line-item budgeting that I just walked through. Um, I think with target-based budgeting, like any, any budget framework, it you know, has some limitations. Um, and one of the primary challenges is that it heavily focuses on inputs and expenditures uh, and growing a base, like an already existing base, rather than you know, outcomes and results and optimizing resource allocation. And so we're trying to, knowing that we still need to do some you know, target-based budgeting and line item budgeting, especially from an accounting perspective, but trying to um, provide a different vantage point or a different lens upon which you can look and make decisions without maybe digging into 
Well, not in detail, although you certainly can, um, but really understanding the programs within the city and what it costs to run those programs and how well aligned they are to your priorities. So we have nine participating departments this year. We moved from three last year to nine. Um, and last year, we really only applied uh, priority-based budgeting to the decision packages from those three departments. But this year, we are doing a much more robust work uh, with the nine departments. And so I want to show you a bit of that. Interrupt real quickly. Yeah, of course. Um, is there a reason why we're only doing nine and not all? Yeah, it ju I mean, just truly learning how to implement. I think we went from three to nine, and we have a pretty good system now. Um, and we were still using ResourceX as a consultant to help with that. The goal is to then do a bigger chunk each year for like the next two years. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so quickly, before I um, lay a little bit of foundation before Cody comes up, uh, or before he comes over here. <coughs> The, uh, the first step of priority-based budgeting and sort of the biggest push of the rollout is the design of the program inventory. Um, a, a PBB, I'm gonna keep saying PBB, PBB program is a new and can be a separate concept from a department's like normal operations or division. So what I mean is a department has existing operational programs, right? And divisions, but those might not be a one-for-one -one match to like a PBB program. So for example, like a program is what you do. It has to answer the question of what you do. So let me let me think of an example that's someone who's not participating. Finance. Hey, Reggie, I'm going to use finance. Um, so finance might have an accounting division or like a treasury division. But when you say like treasury, like what what is that? Like what does it do? So you might say, okay, um, a program, PBB, to measure alignment from like treasury might be payroll processing, like that's the program. And so there are many programs within accounting or treasury, and that's the way you align them. Um, so that's all I mean to say is it's not always like a one for one in the way we're already, you know, organizationally structured. Um, so actually, I think the challenge with, with PBB and program inventory at the beginning is helping departments accurately size their programs. And there is a brochure that we use at the budget fair that uses the analogy of pizza. And I kind of want to grab it because it's really good. Because you guys, y'all aren't hungry. You already ate. So it's fine for me to talk about pizza. Um, so, and I'm going to give you guys this because I really like these brochures that we made. Um, so PBB program, what do you do? If we're asking the question, how much pizza do we have, then how would you answer? You would probably say, like, we have X number of slices. You wouldn't say, well, we have this many pizza boxes. Like, that's too big of a baseline of an analysis, right? Like, that's too big. And you wouldn't say that we have this many pepperonis. Like, that's too small. And so programs in PBB represent the slices. Like, what do we do? How many do we have? Um, and so we've been calibrating with departments saying, okay, that's too big. Like, it's too big to say the courthouse or accounting. It's too small to say, like, oh, we file paperwork or we answer the phone or whatever. So it's just right to say things like payroll processing or court reporting or, you know, so it's some of that calibration that's happened. Have enough front. And that's the biggest push, I think, of PBB implementation. It's, it's the hardest up front. Um, Cody will talk a little bit more about what this has practically looked like, but once people have a program inventory, um, then we cost those programs so that we know both the personnel and non-personnel uh, costs for each. And then the part we're in the middle of now is program scoring. Um, and the departments first score their programs based on a number of criteria, and then um, we go through peer review. And I think at this point, I'm going to let Cody. Mm, I'm going to let Cody talk first to give some alignment, and then I'm going to go back because I think it'll be more helpful. So without further ado, I'm switching to Cody's example of what this looks like in application. All right. Thank you, Christiane. So we wanted to take this approach of this new priority-based budgeting and give you some, some semblance or some understanding of what this looks like from our department's perspective. And I will tell you, as a department director, I was a little hesitant to try this new path forward initially. But over time, through conversations with the Fort Lab, it's, it's been easier to digest. So when you look at our department, it's basically three separate funds. You've got the Environmental Protection Fund at 16.2 million for FY24. You've got the Solid Waste Fund at just over 82 million. And you have the General Fund at 4.5. And you can see that that's covering consumer health. Also, note to mosquitoes, if you see mosquitoes, please reference that over to us. <laughs> and we'll, you can see the different programs that these different funds take into account. But we wanted to take through the priority-based budgeting concept 
to strategize a different way to sort these and to bring these forward. So what we were able to do through that priority of inventory, we were able to take our program divisions or our cost centers and try to go one level deeper and identify the 23 key programs or, or structures that we would like to bring forward at this time. All of these as an external facing department fall in that community category. Now, I'm certainly not gonna go through all 23 of these, but I picked a couple just to show you an example of how we're looking at each unit as kind of an independent business unit rather than doing a deep dive. So one example is the Southeast Landfill fill as, as just one program. Of course, it's critical to our overall community and a place for us to dispose of our, our waste. You can see in the little table below that uh, there's a department rating. We've been able to complete that. And as Christiane mentioned, we're working with other stakeholders across the city to evaluate this, and that will continue. But you can also look at cost drivers of revenue and expenses for each of these different business units. Another good example is the one we just talked about earlier with the Supplemental Highway Litter Abatement Program. There's about 442,000 being invested this fiscal year. We have to talk about priorities and budget overall as we move into FY25 to determine how much we want to invest in a program such as this. Again, those priorities are, are being con considered and continued with the Fort Worth Lab. So just some quick perspectives. We have seen this priorities-based budget concept as a useful framework to underscore program value. Again, it doesn't dictate if a program is going to stay or go or increase or decrease in funding, but it also continues to build that data with all of the priorities and goals that have been set by city council. It encourages an active policy conversation, and by utilizing vantage points from other departments, we're able to really have a deeper conversation to us, to our, to our department, and to our staff these programs are the most important and the most beneficial to the city. But when you bring in other perspectives, you start to look at that across the entire organization. Of course, it also helps to forecast our future needs and identify opportunities to, opt to optimize our resources. So our next steps as a department, we're gonna to continue to work with the Fort Worth Lab to score the rest of our programs across the board. And then of course, we'll be back with that FY25 draft budget in a few months. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now that you have a department example. Um, so peer review is something that we didn't get to last year in our pilot program of PBB. Peer review adds legitimacy and credibility to the process by helping calibrate the way departments score their own importance and their own programs across the organization. Um, and so Cody talked a little bit about us being in the middle of implementing peer review. We're about 15% done with that peer review process. We are reviewing 323 programs across the nine departments. Um, and so that's a lot. And then when you think about um, reviewing each program against each council priority, depending on um, what type of program it is, whether it has an external customer base or an internal customer base. Um, the review is different, but there's four to five for each program, so 323 times four or five. I had the math in my notes, but you can do the math in your head. Um, so that, it's like, no, I can't. <laughs> 1,500, 1,400, something like that, yeah. Uh, it's a lot. So, um, so an example, like Cody said, um, his programs are mostly community, which means they have an external customer base. I think they're actually all community um, and environmental. They all have an external customer base. Um, and so if you think about taking one program in Cody's group and evaluating it, you'd say, okay, this is an external customer base, so it's a community program. Um, and so we'll evaluate it against the council priority of responsible growth, which is one, you know, one of the, the five. Um, so the goals under responsible growth are there, enhancing connectivity, prioritizing preservation of parks, pro proactively planning for growth. And then depending on the level of alignment of his program with each of those goals, that leads to the score. So perhaps, you know, what? The highway litter abatement, does, does it enhance connectivity for communities? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, prioritizing preservation of open space and parks, how aligned is it for that? And then are we proactively planning for growth through the highway litter abatement program? So maybe it's not well aligned or maybe it's somewhat aligned with responsible growth, but then you do that process for every other council priority and that's how you get to a score. So there's some you know, objectivity there. So Cody's group on their own does that and then they do it in front of the peers that are also participating in PBB. And so that's when you start to calibrate, you know, oh, I ranked all my programs as extreme alignment with every council priority, or 
or not, right? And we haven't seen anybody that did that. Ever, trying to, tr people are trying to be objective. But it helps to have to defend your score, you know, to your peers. We, we thought about doing it just with the lab, but we thought, well, that doesn't really add a lot of credibility and legitimacy. Like, we're, we're one body, but... You know. So we've had all nine departments that are participating in PBB um, participate in the peer review, the 15% we've done so far. And the cooler part is that we also opened it up to the non-participating departments so they could start to get a preview, and we didn't really know if anyone would come. Um, but we have had people come. We had water, fire, code, some others. Um, so that's been, uh, FMS was there. So they've come and sat in. And so now they, when they, to, you know, to Councilmember Beck's point, when we uh, implement with other departments, they have a, a huge head start because they can see how people have calibrated their programs and then how they're um, aligned with council priorities. So it's been a neat process. So the results um, is that the, the programs each have a quartile ranking, ranking least to most align, and then we'll have a scoring outcome from the department scores and the peer review. And then that's something we're still conceptualizing, like how do we then share it with city management and how do we share it with you? And how do we overlay you know, the people who are participating and the people who aren't and sort of give you like a good package where you're seeing more levels of detail and um, different data from a couple different groups. And so um, we'll start, I think, I'm hopeful that in a, a future work session we can maybe show you some examples of what it could look like and you can weigh in and say, yes, this is helpful. Um, we also started our one-on-ones with you. We've met with Councilmember Crane, Councilmember Beck, and we have other scheduled for the week and next week. Um, Mark and I will, will talk with you too about, you know, what's helpful. Okay. Thank you again, Cody. So here's the participating nine uh, in PBB. So we have Code and Environmental Development Services, HR and IT, Library, Municipal Court, Police, and TPW. HR, Police, and TPW uh, were our three pilot departments last year, and so they did scoring of their decision packages. Um, again, it was, uh, I would say like, I, think, I would say we're on like phase 1.5, because it was like kind of 0.5 last year. Um, but we're really, really implementing heavily this year. And so we're excited. Um, I think it's, I've been watching it click for a lot of the participating departments. It certainly clicked with the lab staff after a couple of peer review sessions, and we've gotten a lot more efficient um, reviewing, you know, 1,400 different criteria. Okay. Um, let's talk about, does anybody have questions about any of that? Um, I'd like to talk about engagement. So maybe I'll invite Michelle and or Amethyst to come up and talk a little bit about our engagement plans and how they might be different than, uh, you know, what we've done before and how we're trying, part of what the lab's doing is trying to streamline engagement opportunities around, you know, we have the comp plan going on and we have budget ramping up. And so we're really trying to be strategic about that. So one of the things we really want to do with engagement and Amethyst and I have been having these conversations for uh, probably a couple months is we want to be sure we mirror our digital engagement with our in-person engagement so that we know we're reaching different audiences with both of those ways. So what we've been talking about is what are the tools that she can use online to get input and how can we kind of mimic those at our public meetings. So um, I'll talk about some of the things that we have in the engagement office and then she can talk about some of the tools they're going to use for, from the lab. So we have a new portal, it's called Connect Fort Worth, and it will eventually house all of our engagement opportunities for the entire city. So any project or program that we wanna get input on, we will have um, a link on this portal for people to provide input. So we're gonna create a page for the budget, and we'll have a lot of the engagement opportunities linked to that page. Um, we're also going to do, again, the steer the budget where we ask people to do the pictures with Molly to um, tell us about things that they want us to address in the budget. Um, we thought that was a good way to kind of get people engaged and excited, and it gave us some good pictures to use after that. Um, we're having spring open houses. Those are all on your calendar. We're doing five of those, and it will have ways for people to engage with the budget, but it will also have opportunities for most city departments to um, provide input and information on different programs that they have. And we'll, like I said, at the open house, we will have interactive activities that mimic what Amethyst and the Fort Worth lab team are doing with some of their digital tools. And then we'll follow that up after the proposed budget comes out. We'll do another round of open houses and meetings to let people know about the proposed budget and um, 
get their input or their comments and answer questions about it. One of the things we really want to do with the open house, you know, if we say we're having a budget meeting, we don't get a huge number of people like knocking on the door to come to the meeting. So what we want to do with these open houses is we want to weave in the budget input with fun activities that people can do. We'll have activities for children. We'll also have activities for adults. So hopefully we'll get a good crowd to come out and they'll be very engaged, but they won't really feel like they're, they're um, sitting through a budget meeting. So if you want to add some more stuff. Sure, Amethyst Sloan, Strategy and Performance Manager for Worth Lab. Um, so I'm pretty excited about a lot of things Michelle just talked about. So Fort Worth Connect is going to be a game changer for us. It's that one-stop shop. No matter what we're asking for input on resident-wise, everything will be there. So we'll have that one page that everything you can do. The meetings will be listed. All of the online activities that you can do will all be in one place, really easy to find. So some of the online activities, we're really thinking about the budget in those two phases. Phase one being kind of May through the recommended budget. And we're really, we want to be explicit about asking folks to help us develop the budget. So those activities are going to centralize around your council priorities. There'll be an activity where they, we ask them to rank the priorities. We'll have a little bit of information demographics, where they live, so we can provide you as council members in that specific information about your district. So in my district of all five council priorities, these are how they rack, uh, rank in that area to help me make decisions. Then we're going to use the thought exchange tool to ask specifically about your thoughts, concerns, or ideas for the budget. So that's where we'll get those very specific, like more money for homelessness activities, litter cleanup, et cetera. And again, we'll have information, data, demographics to be able to give you that information on a regular basis by council district. And the mapping activity that Michelle uh, talked about will also be on that website. So you can put a little pin, a little green pin for something that you love and would like to see more of in that place or something that needs to be fixed or there's a need. So we'll have have, you know, a variety of different ways to interact. During the uh, subsequent budget uh, work sessions we have with you and outside, we're going to give you pings on that information probably two or three times between now and the end of July before you get the recommended budget so that you have a summarization of what the asks, wants, needs, likes um, for the city overall are, but also for your respective districts. So you have that information at hand as you go out and talk to your constituents about their thoughts about the budget. You'll have what we're receiving on our end as well. Um, and then again, we will be at each of those open houses um, and other meetings, et cetera, as we go to deploy those same activities, both in an in-person format and also um, online. We're also going to work with Michelle and her team to see what we can do for interactive activities and package those as kind of a meeting in a box. So folks can deploy that at a, with a church group or a school group or anywhere else so that it's not necessarily easy enough that you don't have to rely on staff to facilitate, but we can still get that extra input. Um, I have a question here. I don't, uh, I mean, I support the open house format. I think it draws a lot of people out and you know, helps accommodate their own individual schedules. That's all great. Support that. What I'd like to know in my district is that, um, and I'm sure other council members will too, how many of these open houses will be in our own individual districts? And aside from at-large resident outreach, are we going to be making specific outreach to the registered neighborhood organizations as well? Right now we have five um, open houses scheduled in for the spring, and um, we've tried to geographically spread those around the city and also hit areas that we aren't currently having comp plan meetings scheduled, so we tried to spread all of those out. It was 12 meetings total that we were scheduling, and we tried to, you know, take it take a look at the map, the planning sectors, and the districts, and find a geographic spread that was hitting most of the community. When we do the five in the fall, we will look at the locations that the council districts and planning sectors that did not have an open house in the spring and schedule those for the fall. So that's the plan right now, just because of resources and staffing that's involved with the open houses. And on the Connect Fort Worth, right now we're building that website, um, the, the portal. We're adding projects right now. It has the comp plan page, but we're building others on the back end. And then we're doing kind of a soft launch with the comp plan, but we'll have a bigger launch once we have most of the projects and the budget page up. If you want to visit it, it's www.connectfw.com.
Any other questions? www.connectfw.com. I would just like to make a comment on the meeting locations. As we were going through the meeting locations for the comprehensive mm -hmm. plan, we noticed uh, some places in my district, the closest place to attend a meeting for that particular topic was over a 30-minute drive for residents each way. So let's, let's please take in mind total travel time anywhere in the city to be able to attend these and uh, not end up in a situation like that again. Okay, thank you. So my opinion is that no one wants to come to a public meeting anymore. <laughs> and you get the same people that come. Yes. And it's just a reality of where people are. We're such much more of an on-demand culture. And furthermore, I think the folks I talk to would rather react to our ideas or what we're proposing and say yes or no, or maybe I'm in the middle, rather than have to proactively say this is what I want in the budget. And so really thinking through probably utilizing social media in a different way. It's almost like the survey of these are our top five priorities. These are the things we're funding this year. These are the continual items that are going to come from FY 24 to 25. What do you think? Rather than just tell us. And I, I, I know some other cities are grappling with this because everybody has the same struggle, so we're not unique. But it's, it's really time that we completely revolutionize the way we do this because I'm sure it's very frustrating for city staff, too, that go to dozens of public meetings and the same 25 people come to those meetings and it's a it's a huge waste of your time and so well, I don't have an answer for our solution today but just acknowledging that's a problem and that how can we all also pitch in to help meet that differently because um, I know we've all talked about that Michael yeah, I'll uh, reiterate something I said the other day at the council meeting at the Fort Worth Food and Wine Festival. Eric Flatiger's group was out there with the 2050 Comprehensive Great Plan. Great idea. So I don't know if they were out at Main Streets this week or whatever, but I think we need to look at big events we know people are already going to go to mm -hmm. and get the reactions. And there. they're having fun at those events, and they're willing to spend five minutes. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, yeah, rather than that way your staff doesn't get burned out or frustrated so often and having we, to be at all those. Yeah, we've been working with the... Um, team doing the comp plan and um, identifying places where people are already meeting Great. and going to them and not expecting people to come to us. When Amethyst and I were putting together the plan, we know that um, we're getting different generations at our public meetings versus, you know, if we had things more digital. And we want to hear from everybody, but you're right, the public meetings are a lot more time intensive, it takes a lot more staff, and um, sometimes the attendance is low. And mm -hmm. so we want to try and have multiple opportunities and ways for people to give us the input and, um, and then bring that together and present it to you. Also, to bring this back to priority-based budgeting, once we have all departments on that system, I think we're going to be amazed at the different ways that we can explain the budget, what's important in the budget, and the decisions that we're actually making through that lens than we can right now with line item budget. So I think that's going to be a game changer, and you might see a third phase in that approach to the budget in kind of what do you want, here's what we think the major decisions are going to be, and then here's what the recommended is. So I can see PBB really leading us in that direction in a much stronger way that, that anybody could explain to someone that maybe, maybe the average staff member couldn't explain a line item way to the public too. Michelle might know this or Renee, what's our number of individuals that have signed up for City News right now in the City of Fort Worth? Ooh, I want to say it's around 30,000. Yeah, I mean that just gives you an idea of you know, a city of almost a million people. Well, and the other thing we did at the public meeting is we've started asking people, how did you find out about the meeting? So we can see which of our tools is having the most impact in getting people there. And um, so we're using that information to kind of change the way we get the word out mm -hmm. about the different meetings. Okay. We can keep working on it. Thank you all very much for your hard work. We appreciate it. Thanks. Great. I have one correction to make. Um, on this slide, I put that code is participating, and they are not. We swapped them with neighborhood services, so please don't think that they are. And I <laughs> apologize to neighborhood services, too. Thank you to my many staff who emailed me during this meeting and told me that. Okay, so um, it looks like we might give you like 10 minutes of your life back, but um, I just want to, I'm hoping that 
that little bit of a dive into foundation. I think normally at this time of year, you wouldn't really even know where the general fund is sitting with regard to a target budget. So I'm hoping that's helpful um, and we can dive into any of that that you would like. Um, we're planning to meet again in two weeks, knowing from my sharing of the budget calendar that departments still will not have fully submitted their budgets at that time. I'm wondering um, what would be helpful or if you have preliminary ideas as to um, either PBB departments or non-participating departments uh, that you'd like some early preliminary dives into that will help you as you, you know, start to think about the fiscal year 25 budget uh, or any other subjects that you're interested in because we want these to be useful to you. Any comments on that? Any comments or questions? I see. No. Go ahead. This may not be the right venue and it may be a very unpopular request. It's okay. Um, the street maintenance fee. Mm -hmm. um, as we're walking, I know we have a task force set up and we're working, you know, on that. I would love to sit down and better understand if we don't go down that path, the street maintenance fee, how can we find those dollars or do some scenario planning right sure. now and so we can have those conversations and have a better understanding fiscally where we stand um, with that piece. And I, I, that, I don't know if anybody else agrees, but I'm really not on board with the street maintenance fee right now. So I think having a better understanding of where we are budgeting for 2025 would be helpful. Thank you. And I think you you stated that our growth estimate right now is we're operating off of four percent assumption. Is that correct? That's correct. And you're looking right now at a three point five percent budget increase. That's correct. So just based on that, I know it's not there yet, but let's think about maybe next session talking about tax rate and what our goals are around that. It doesn't mean we stick to it, but operating on the assumption if things continue where they are, are we going to be at no new revenue? Yes or no. If we, because there's no reason to do this last minute anymore. There's no reason to have a fight on the dais and not of the budget vote, right? So we can work through some of this um, as much as we can. And I think we all know that right now, more than any other time I've worked in city government, people are very focused on the economy, inflation, cost of living, property taxes is a big piece of that. So let's just meet people where they are. And importantly, when we make the tax rate decision and the budget decision, we can defend it, um, especially this body being more involved in that decision making process. Yeah, I was just going to say that the, the four percent comes from the three and a half percent basic cap, mm -hmm. uh, plus a half percent growth, which is very conservative, mm -hmm. and that's where we start with the pay go. And so, to your point, uh, when you look at that, the inc well, we we heard already from the chief appraiser about what he's already seen. He and his team were already seen in terms of appraisals. So it's not going to be a year like we've seen the last two years. It's going right. to be a tighter year. Um, at the same time, you know, we need to address this EMS issue that you all are, you know, uh, working very hard on. Um, and then the street issue, the street maintenance issue. And this is our last year for recapture also, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. thing to think mm -hmm. about. Right, right. We have an increment too. Um, so what we can do is play out some scenarios, not really knowing what the final number is going to be, and then have, have that discussion, like you said, so that it's not all at the last minute. I think that's helpful. Uh, Mayor and, and council members, I just had a light bulb idea. Uh, we had one of the planned 2050 meetings in my district last week, and I was, you, know, you all know, I very seldom give out compliments for outreach. But in this case, well, you know, everybody knows that. But we had a real good turnout. And Mayor, as you know, I was dead social media, so I couldn't do my usual. I didn't do a robocall. But whatever tech, uh, tactics Michelle and her team pulled off, it worked. But it dawned on me when we talk about people not wanting to come to a meeting, most of these attendees were probably 50 and older. And so you will want to be mindful of who, what demographic we're reaching out to. And we did have several people from Woodhaven who are new to District 5 and excited about being there. And so, but you know, I wanted to give them kudos. But when you think about who was there, it was an older demographic. So I think we might even have ways to just get people at these trails and marches and whatever so that we can meet them where they are. But not, it's, they did a good job for these people who turned out. And, and, and I had a protester there who did not step on the property. He was, he was out front. But uh, it, was, it was well attended. So just, just FYI. Any other questions or comments? Thank you all very much. This was helpful. With that, Council, I think.
meeting adjourned. <laughs>